this webinar. We're, we're really thrilled to have you with us as we wait to let everyone join in. I encourage you to please introduce yourselves in the chat, say hi to your fellow attendees, and perhaps even share where you're joining in from. Um, before we start, a few housekeeping notes. Um, first is that you can leave your comments on the right side of your screen. Um, second, to ask questions, please leave them in the Q&A section where there's a question mark on the right. This will help us address them more efficiently at the end of this webinar. Um, third, our session is currently being recorded, and so we'll be sending you this recording um, via email after this webinar. And so today we're diving into how to bridge the execution gap in modern analytics with Data IQ and Cognizant. And so if you're here to learn more about this topic, you are in the right place. With us here today is, sorry, um, with our with us here to our, today are our speakers, Jerno, um, a field CDO at Data IQ, and Sandeep, a global offering leader in AI and, and analytics at Cognizant. They will both be leading the session today. Um, we're also really excited to share that Data IQ and Cognizant have collaborated to survey 200 IT leaders from the from large companies worldwide. This collaboration provides us valuable insights on Gen AI, tech stack, data challenges, and more, which we'll be discussing today. And so once again, thank you all for joining us. Let's get started. And so I'll be passing it over to you, Jerno and Sandeep. Thank you very much, Renata. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, maybe as we've already been introduced, maybe we'll jump into a little bit of the background of this study. Uh, and I think maybe if you go to the first slide, and I'll just highlight a couple of key key points. Is the slide visible for everyone? If it is, perfect. So the as Renato already, already said, the, the study was performed jointly with Cognizant, Data Q and Cognizant. And we, we spoke to about 200 leaders and everyone we spoke to was or had the decision authority in the data or AI software space. So either individually, so they could make these decisions or as part of their of their peer group. Um, and there we go with the slides. Maybe one slide back. That would be perfect. And, and that is important because obviously, as we ask these different questions and wanted to understand a little bit what is going on in these organizations in the uh, you know in terms of the data and AI maturity, we want, we wanted to make sure that we speak to people who, who have this decision power and can make the decisions based on what they see and what they see is necessary. Um, also important, we've mostly spoken or basically only spoken to large companies or about $1 billion uh, annual revenue. About half of them were even about $10 billion revenue, so significant size for these companies. Um, and I think one of the really important parts I want to call out here is that the responses were a course fairly equally distributed across four big industry buckets. So retail and consumer goods, financial services and banking, uh, healthcare and life sciences, and also manufacturing and in in industrial. So we're not talking about a specific industry issue or, or problems in one industry, but it's really across the board. And I think that's important to, to take away from this from this, uh, from this this background here of the study. Sandeep, do you have any additional points of this for the study or the methodology? Yes, Jadol. So thank you for uh, setting this up. And uh, by the way, I was just looking at the audience. We have got folks from Egypt, from London, from Canada, New York, amongst others. I think it's amazing um, the diversity of the audience uh, who's come in, as well as the diversity of the, uh, the survey respondents over there. Uh, one additional thing I'd like to talk about is this survey was, was extremely deep and wide. We asked the respondents a lot of questions around what are the challenges with the data infrastructure? Uh, where exactly they are doing generative AI? What kind of challenges they face with generative AI? Where do they work on the data? Uh, and so on. Uh, a lot of what we are going to talk about today is a summary of the many themes that, that came out of the, of the survey. Right. Jeno, back to you. So yeah, let's go to the first point. And just to, to make clear in terms of what we're planning to do, the study obviously is very wide. There's a lot of information in it. What we're planning to do today is really to focus on four key areas that we picked out of the study, which I think 
paints a very good picture of what's going on. And we'll discuss those. And obviously, please ask as many questions as you can in the chat. We'll make sure we leave time at the end, and then hopefully we can address these questions, or at least the main themes in these questions. Uh, so let's start off with the with one of the key points. Obviously, what we see in the industry and also what comes out of the survey is this key point that CIOs or data executives are tasked with, with introducing AI, generative AI specifically, into the organization and trying to scale it and make it large and, and, and productionalize it. And one of the key points here is obviously, well, are they enabled to do this from a, from a financial point of view? Do they have the budget? And from the survey, what we see here on the slide is really that pretty much all of the surveyed people do uh, experiment with generative AI, they have the budget. Around 85% say they have budget, either a dedicated one or the budget comes from, from another budget has been reallocated to, to the Gen AI field. Uh, and, also, in terms of actual spend, about, I think, 46% say that they are planning to spend more than $1 million over the next 12 months. And 11% even say that they're planning to spend more than $10 million going forward. Now, that's obviously, from a vendor point of view, amazing. And I think it's, it's the right thing to do. And it also reflects the point that companies do not see the generative AI development just as a short-lived type, but it's a very substantial change in the, in the landscape. Uh, but the one point I found really interesting here when you look into the data a bit more is that a lot of the organizations who, or the respondents who said that they are facing internal either organizational issues or policy problems and therefore cannot use generative AI or large language models as they would like, of those respondents, 39% are still planning to spend about $1 million going forwards in this specific field. And that, of course, raises the questions, well, is there a lot of investment happening that might not bring the value that people are thinking about it or hoping to see from, from these investments? Sandeep, what is your view on that? I think we need to look at the uh, this particular survey result through a variety of lenses, you know. Um, the first lens I would like to, to talk about is that generative AI and LLMs have bought a period of uncertainty and a period of change at the same time. So nobody's figured it out. Everybody is in there to go ahead and get ahead in the game to do different things, experiment, explore, get a few learnings and understand really how to get to the transformative potential of this technology. So we are still in early phases. The second lens that we need to look at is any technology that has become transformational, it has at least taken two to three decades to do it. So if you look at internet, started probably in the late 60s, but truly gone mainstream in the late 90s. Uh, social network started in, in late 70s, truly went mainstream in the early 2000s, right? And the intersection of social and internet essentially drew the, the transformation with digital and e-commerce amongst many others. So. Compared to that time frame, generative AI is still very early on. Uh, nothing warms my heart as a systems integrator when I see clients committed to building new capabilities and nothing speaks to commitment as a committed spend. Uh, so clients will figure this out. Now, if we take a look at what exactly have clients been doing, most of the use cases that they have been working on classify across four categories. Either they are to increase revenue, or they are to manage risk, or they are to increase efficiency, or they are to improve non-financial image. So those are all the four categories. And by and large, I would say majority of the use cases that clients are doing are in the improve efficiency uh, bucket. Uh, there have been some good examples, such as in life sciences, where a lot of uh, good applications of the summarization capabilities of generative AI have been put to use in the discovery, preclinical, clinical phases. We have also seen some clients rush into the generative AI, uh, such as a major airline in Canada that had to pay for a policy that was hallucinated by a chatbot. Uh, so my sense is we have to look at this as clients have a tremendous belief in the transformative potential of generative AI. Clients are working to explore and find out more. And they, we will see investments across those four categories that I spoke about and things will eventually get better. 
Jerno, is this consistent with what you are hearing from your clients as well? Jerno, you're on mute. Sorry. <clears throat> Yes, I still need to get used to that one. Uh, so yes, absolutely, it is actually. And I think there's also an interesting stat from the survey which showed that from all the respondents, 70% are working with generative AI, but 50 are still in the process of experimenting and, and, and looking how, you know, basically the proof of concept kind of area. And only 20% stated they are already in production. So having actual use cases they identified who they believe will bring value to the organization and justifies the potentially significant cost for these kind of uh, generative AI use cases. I think one of the interesting aspects here when you, when coming back to the budget or also use cases and budget is, is from the fact that about, I think half of them stated that the actual budget for generative AI doesn't come or it comes from other budgets. And I would assume it comes from other data or IT budgets. And I think we'll touch base later on that around, you know, some of the basics, the basic AI pipeline that is required, but data quality and, you know, data governance. So some of the basics. And I wonder or I worry that a big part of these budgets that are now being reallocated or shifted are coming from these basics. And while that in the short term might not cause potential issues, but it will cause an issue in organizations once they try to move into this kind of productionizing and industrializing the generative AI use cases, because they will find, well, we, we save money in the wrong place because data quality, data governance is still a problem in our, in our company, and it will then continue to be a problem. And there's obviously a danger that uh, the actual value from this proof of concept, proof of concepts, might not be as high as companies hope they will be. That's correct. Now, if we go on to the next slide, uh, let's also look at what exactly are clients doing with generative AI, and what are the layers of operational risk and challenges that they are facing. So, we ask the our, our respondents in terms of the the types of generative AI and LLMs they use. Uh, I would say it was a fairly even distribution between hosted LLM services, self-hosted open source LLMs, or other generative AI models such as um, multimodal models and so on. But specifically, what were the, the levels of operational risk that these clients had to overcome or they face in deploying these models? Uh, there were some pretty interesting statistics that came out of it. Around 26% of our respondents said that they faced infrastructure challenges. Uh, and majority of the infrastructure challenges were focused around the themes of expertise, know-how, um, connecting legacy data environments to these um, LLM environments. Uh, I think we had around 31% of our respondents also said that they faced policy challenges. Now, policy challenges were cited as red tape, uh, a significant compliance burden to get all the sign-offs. Uh, we also heard about French and German um, regulatory laws and audit burdens that are that are coming through. Uh, now, outside of the infrastructure and policy burdens, we also saw uh, our respondents talk about the fact that their environments are not modern. 88% of the respondents said that uh, they don't feel they have the right tooling or processes to manage LLMs um, in their environments. Uh, we had around 43% of our respondents that said that uh, they don't feel their environment is modern. Uh, and what do we mean by environment is not modern? I think they said that they would like to see less tooling. They would like to see generative AI embedded in their tooling. And they also see uh, said that they would like to see the data ecosystem move to the cloud. So those are the, the various layers of, of operational risk, the challenges that our respondents said they face or they, they're facing or they face as they deployed LLMs. Uh, Jerno, I'm curious, uh, given that they are, these, these challenges are wide and vast, how should clients think about addressing them? Um, is there a framework? Is there something that they need to start with first or and so on. How, how does one go about fixing these or overcoming these challenges? Yeah, so I think one of the key points you, I think you alluded to was that the companies are still facing these, these some kind of standard working, don't have the right tooling in place, still working with some tools that aren't fit for purpose. Uh, and also, I think you mentioned the, the fact that, you know, it's still this, they don't have the data in the right place, it's isolated. It's basically a lot of the same issues that been plaguing companies for the last decade or longer, to be honest. 
And I think now with generative AI, it, it feels like there's a bit of a, like a spotlight been put on these problems because on the one side, I think there's this perception that our oh, generative AI use case is really easy to do and really easy to implement. And it's probably easy to see why, right? Because you constantly hear about these new models being amazing and incredibly flexible. You know, you can put text in, you can put voice in or pictures, and somehow they still come back with reasonable answers. But in an industrial or in a corporate setting, it obviously looks slightly different. You still need this whole end-to-end -end data and AI pipeline. You still need to be able to get to the data quickly if you want to experiment with something. You then still need to be able to transform it in, in the way you need it for the specific use case. And then, you know, you, you need to do the actual AI modeling either by, you know, using a, a self-hosted open source LLM or using a, a hosted version. But all of that, ideally, you do as quickly as possible. And in order to then deploy the actual use case and actually be able to get value. And if you are not able to do that, do this quickly and do it repetitively, if you need to repeat it again or do it again for maintenance reasons, I think companies are, still in this po in the in this in the situation where they will not get most value out of them because they haven't paid or are not paying enough attention potentially to this end-to-end -end pipeline they're very much focused now on quickly let's get some data into some of these large language models and like try to get the value out of them and let's not lose you know this race in order to to bring generative ai into the company but i think the basics still need to be done and i think the additional operational risk that is now coming from these large language models is obviously on top of all of these issues. So what I mean with that specifically is the fact that, you know, previously you built an AI use case, let's say you build a recommendation engine and you could fairly clearly calculate or, or estimate what is that going to cost you, right? You're going to have your three, four say, data scientists. This is the data. This is how much time it will need. And then you, you may need to train it. It's fine, but that was all still overseeable. And then you deploy it on your web page. And once someone uses it on the web page, these actual costs are well, negligible. They, they don't really add much or compared to at least now, where a lot of these costs are happening later actually during the usage stage. So it makes it a lot more difficult for companies to upfront, decide, and, and have an overview or understand it even. Well, just building them, but then how is this going to look in production? How much is that going to cost me? And I think this additional new operational risk is something they, or most companies, are not fully set up to face yet in an, ex in an efficient way at least. And that is something they need to, to address. I, I agree. I agree, Jerno. In fact, uh, I think uh, AI will put a spotlight to, uh, to basic good data practices, such as data quality, data observability, as you rightly said. Uh, clients will have to address them. Uh, but then also, we believe that AI would drive the next wave of cloud modernization uh, to make sure that you can go ahead and scale it up uh, what you are doing right now in exploration and experimentation. And I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's what also what we see with our clients, right? They are in the situation saying, oh, well, we need to modernize our, our whole tech stack and we need to be ready for this, for these Gen AI use cases. On a very positive side, that obviously means they're going to be ready for all the other, let's call them traditional AI use cases as well. So I think from my perspective, that's an all positive development. Uh, I think there are certain aspects that make this move riskier than it might have previously been. And I think we touched later, we'll touch base it or touch base on it later on when we talk about security and governance as well. But uh, overall, yes, we see this kind of modernization as well. Should we move on to the next slide, to the next main point? Yeah, perfect. And this one, I think, Sandeep, you already mentioned in, in, in some of your comments what you see. And just to explain what we see here, we, we asked companies or our, our, in the survey, well, how many tools are you currently using along the end-to-end -end data pipeline? So data ingestion, data storage, data quality governance, visualization, ML training, and so on. So everything from the kind of source system stage to all the way to the on the right where they deploy them into production. How many tools are you using along these lines and at each of these steps? And what you can see here on the left is their current situation. And 60% are stating that they use more than five tools. Actually, an interesting fact is I think about 10% say they use more than 13 or, or even 13 tools. So that's a, a huge number, of course. But then when you ask them about what in, in an ideal world or how much tools would you like to have, that picture flips over and you see that the majority, over 70% or around 70%, say, well, actually five or less would be ideal. And only very few say, well, more than five. That's still, I think, an interesting interesting aspect. But the majority says, well, less is better. And 
I think from our point of view, I think we agree with this move because I think there has been this, this expansion of tools. And I think, Sandeep, you put this nice slide in the presentation, maybe we can quickly jump to that one. I think it's the next slide. Yeah, exactly this one. Do you want to say a few words to this uh, to this nice? I think most people know it, but maybe you can explain it's, a little uh, bit. It's Mad Turk's uh, Mad Landscape, and I think uh, this is the 2024 edition. What jumped out to me was that there are six core categories of, of or areas of tooling, and there are more than 100 different subcategories. So imagine if a client were to have a comprehensive data and analytics ecosystem, it could be possible that they can have 100 different tools. So from that lens, 5 and 10 and 13 doesn't look so bad, right? Uh, but coming back to the point, the point is, is the hypothesis that less tools in the ecosystem will make one more agile and more tools are a barrier to agility. Um, when I looked at the survey results, I noticed that the clients who said that they had Genia in production, the average number of tooling that they said was around nine. And for clients who said they did not have generative AI in production, the number of tooling for them averaged around five. So my sense is in the short term, uh, as clients expand their best of breed ecosystems, the number of tooling will increase. But then aspirationally, the clients want the number of tooling to go down. And we do see the hyperscalers and the large independent software vendors start creating horizontal capabilities so that the clients don't have to go ahead and, and get a different tool for every need they have. So I think, for example, um, Data IQ with its LLM mesh capabilities and allowing generative AI to be managed uh, everything end to end. Uh, you look at AWS coming with MaxDome, Azure with Fabric, uh, Google uh, with Vertex and, and BigQuery and AlloyDB, uh, Snowflake with Horizon and Polaris, Databricks with Unity Catalog. Uh, pretty much every tooling out there is expanding horizontally. So my sense is that over a period of time, the number of tooling will go down, but at least in the short term, we will see a little bit of proliferation of technologies as uh, clients bring generative AI into their ecosystems and scale them forward. Uh, Jerno, your thoughts on, on this? How do you see this uh, playing along? Yeah, I think I think I agree. And and this this fact about you know people who have it in production have slightly more tools than the others is, is an interesting one. I think I agree with the point that I think that's a temporary or intermediary snap as people trying to get to the general use cases as quickly as possible. So I think it's it's natural that they add to what they already have rather than going this whole big step of consolidating. And I, I think it's also these high number of tools. Uh, it, I think it's simply a, 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 a representation of the fact that there aren't very many tools out there at the moment, at least, who, who are able to do this end to end, who are able to ingest data, transform it, build machine learning cases or AI use cases, and then deploy it in the production environment that you have. And, and I think this is simply, that's why these number seven to 13 or eight, seven to eight, 13 technologies, it's just a reflection of that. And that will change, as you mentioned, right? The big companies, the big hyperscalers are moving into that, into that direction. We, we've been in that field basically since our creation. We've always wanted to have this end-to-end -end kind of capability in one platform. And I think going forward, as you mentioned earlier, as companies are looking into modernizing their data cloud or the data stack, they will look into, into this, this consolidation. Because whether there is an optimal number, I doubt. That depends so much on each, you know, com on, on the situation of each company, the size of the company, and so on. But I think generally, I would put my money on the fact that having less tools along this whole end-to-end -end pipeline will make it easier and less costly for companies to build AI use cases quickly. You have less training, you have you know, less people involved needing to maintain different tools and making sure they work efficiently uh, with each other. So it should be just much quicker and, and more efficient to build these use cases. And it should also be enable companies to, to reuse components of one use case in the next use case. So I fully believe there will be a consolidation. I, I'm, 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 I love this, you know, having options and optionality of different tools at every angle. I, I've been a data scientist, but 
you know, from a corporate point of that point of view, it doesn't make sense. I think you need some consolidation. And the only the only maybe flip side to that that I think people companies or people need to be aware of or careful is making sure that they're, they're not ending up in a in a kind of you know call it closed ecosystem or an ecosystem that doesn't allow them to quickly respond to potentially a new and changing landscape, right? Generative AI came onto the market, at least for the wider public, very, very quickly. There's nothing to say that in the next year or in two years, something similar is going to happen. So I think companies need to be aware that whatever solution they choose, that solution needs to offer this optionality. So it needs to be able to work together with some of the very standard cloud providers, other companies that are there in the moment, but they also need to be able to extract and get data or information out of these systems as easy, easy as possible. So it needs to be a system that is open for working in the wider ecosystem rather than saying, come to us and you will never need to go to anywhere else. Because I don't think that's a safe bet at the moment in, a, in an industry and in a landscape that is so incredibly dynamic. I mean, there's new tools, new models coming out every couple of months. And I think for any organization, it's impossible to really say where it's going to be in the next five years or in the next three years. Even. So that flexibility, I think, is something that all organizations need to have going forward. That is correct. And I, I think the, the aspiration, the, the one thing I hear from clients more often than not is this, this concept of vendor lock-in. Mm -hmm. And in order to avoid vendor lock-in, uh, they will end up having a best of breed ecosystem. And with the best of breed ecosystem, it inevitably uh, leads to a proliferation of tools and technology. So somewhere culturally as well, organizations will have to rethink their strategy of whether they want to be best in class and uh, put their eggs in, in one basket uh, or really think about uh, still having uh, the best of breed, having the best tool for the best use case and, and so on. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, I, I do believe in consolidation as well. So we'll see how that comes along. Nice. All right. Um, let's move on to uh, the the next operational challenge that we we saw at the the clients, right? Which is we asked them a question: uh, What were their main challenges with their current data infrastructure? I must say that I was surprised with the results, although I shouldn't have been. Uh, Forty five percent of people said that uh, their biggest data infrastructure challenges around data usability and quality. 27% talked about data access. When we think about data access, uh, it was around making sure that they have access uh, to their data, uh, the, the legacy systems, and so on. 17% uh, talked about security, uh, things like they don't want their data to be accessed by anybody else outside. They don't want their data to go outside, and so on. And 11% talked about compute scalability, uh, which sort of talked around, do we have the right infrastructure so that we can keep on uh, running heavy duty generative AI use cases or not? Are we using GPUs and so on? So I would have assumed that security and scalability would have ranked higher because as clients execute these generative AI use cases at scale, uh, these two are extremely, extremely important. You need to make sure that your environment is secure, your environment is compliant, uh, as well as you need to make sure that you have the right performance. Uh, but on the flip side, we saw data quality and data access uh, show up as the top two uh, by a large margin. Now, when we looked at the data quality, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is what people meant by data quality. Uh, lack of clean data. Now, um, I, 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 I would sort of say clean in double quotes, in air quotes, right? Like what exactly is clean data? We'll, we'll sort of come to that. Uh, there's also 27% of people said they don't have trust in their data, right? And 24% talked about the lack of the right tools, skills, and outdated, outdated tools uh, that they have in the, in the environment, right? Now, my hypothesis is that when the data and analytics ecosystems evolved over the last three decades, um, initially the biggest use case for data was, was business intelligence and reports and KPIs. And there were a set of rules and you had to compute a KPI in a certain way. And if you computed a KPI and it didn't pass the sniff test, you said, I don't trust that KPI. I don't trust the data. I don't trust it. Right. It was always a very easy way out for businesses sometimes to say, well, that KPI, I don't like what it's saying, so probably the data is wrong. Exactly. Exactly. 
Now, when we move to the paradigm of AI and Gen AI and advanced analytics, the concept of clean and trust, uh, the, the boundary sort of dissolves a little bit. Uh, uh, half a decade ago, I was working on a, uh, on a causality model uh, using mutual information theory algorithms. Um, and our mantra was not to apply any filters to the data. The system should be able to go ahead and understand the data, remove the noise from the data, and identify the causal factors of what variables and a combination of super variables impacted the others, right? Uh, so I don't think there is a need necessarily to go ahead and apply a medallion architecture and clean the data and scrub it to its cleanest form and only then move it to Gen AI because uh, I think one school of thought also is that if you do too much cleaning, you are anyways introducing a little bit of bias um, in your data by, by removing some parts out. Uh, so I agree that overall in the in the organizational landscape, data quality and, and data access uh, can definitely be improved. But I also feel that uh, they should not stop you uh, from driving your, your Gen AI use cases. And you really have to look at fit for purpose. Uh, do I have the right data for the right purpose? Uh, and if yes, uh, then I need to apply. I need to see what it tells me. And more often than not, I need to enrich and augment my information sources. And as I enrich and augment and add more sources, the quality of the recommendations, the quality of the outputs uh, will, will improve and increase or, as well. Yeah, Jeno, your thoughts on this? I, I, I... I think there are a couple of points, and I'll come back to them. But I think I fully agree with this approach to to data cleaning or or the you know the lack of clean data and does it stop you from doing a use case? And uh, I've seen it too many times where people in in in, in started off these large data cleaning or, or or tidying up exercises and and they spend you know lots of money on it and the you know actual value when you ask so what's the value right now is obviously very hard to pinpointed and maybe even impossible. And while there might be some inherent value of having nice clean data, I think it needs to become, as you said, in the context of a use case. So if I have a use case and I see I cannot do this use case because the data is not good enough, it's not granular enough, I need to address that, absolutely. But I wouldn't start off saying, well, let's spend the next couple of months going through our data and, and making sure it's nice and clean because you don't really need know what you, as you said, well, how clean and what does clean mean for which specific use case, you know? So, I think you need to always look at the use case, identify the, the use cases that you think bring the most value to your organization, ideally, obviously, quickly, but even if it takes a bit longer, those are the use cases you want to focus on. And then you look at the data and say, okay, what is the data? Is it good enough for that use case? And you build it up from them. And if you need to rectify certain things in, in systems because the data that is captured doesn't live up to what you need, then that's all fine because it's in, in this context of one clear business goal that you have and that the business understands. Other way, I think there's this danger. It's it's just one of these, you know, the data or the IT team is doing some initiative and the business doesn't really see what they are getting out, out of it. So I, I think I fully agree with that point. One of what I found interesting when I saw this, and I know you said you, you weren't that surprised or maybe a little bit, no, you actually said you were surprised uh, about the data quality still being this main issue. And, and I agree, right? I mean, you probably could put that slide 10 years ago and most people would say, yeah, yeah that, make, that makes sense. Uh, when, when I looked at the data, I believe there's uh, some further stats in the in the survey, and I think one of the questions was, well, who's responsible for your data and data quality? And the answer of, I think, nearly 50% said, well, it's IT or a centralized team, which I guess means a centralized data team. And and that one I find incredible that still today, after years of the data mesh and you know people be, who collect or create data being responsible, there's still the majority or half of the of the respondents saying, well, there's a central team responsible for the data. And that, of course, won't scale. It doesn't work. And I think that's why people don't trust the data, because it's well, someone else's work. But clearly, it's not someone else's work. Right? If you're sitting in marketing or in sales and you want clear KPIs about your sales pipeline, well, it's your team that's responsible for these KPIs, so making sure you've got the sales discipline going through, making sure that everything you know moves along in in your in your sales system, and only then will you be able to have clean data later on if you want to look at other use cases. And I'm obviously not singling out sales here; it's every team, marketing, business, marketing, procurement. But the idea that central data team is responsible, I think, is just it's just flawed. No organization can afford 
team large enough to actually then make sure the data is in, in, in a shape and easy to use. So I think that's one of the, the main points that struck me here in this, uh, when I saw the outcome of that. And that's still, I think only, I think 30% or 20% said they, the business is responsible for the data, which I thought, well, okay, there's at least some, some seeds, but it's by far not enough so far. So that I think is, is one of the key ones which I, I, I got from that point here. And six percent um, of that of that audience also said that nobody is responsible for the quality of the data. Uh, so, yeah. So that's uh, exactly. It feels like this. I mean, it's always been right. Data governance, data quality, been always has always been this unloved child, which no one really wanted to do. It's definitely been not been a career driver in any organization. But as as we discussed earlier, it is so important still. And even if you only do it on a use case by use case basis you need to have easy access to your data and it needs to be fit for purpose. It doesn't need to be perfect, but it needs to be fit for purpose. And hoping that someone else will do that is, I think, misplaced that hope. So so that is is one of the main points. The other thing I, when maybe even if you can go a slide back where we had, I think the other ones around compute availability and I think security. And I wonder whether, oops, maybe yeah, the other way, exactly. So. I wonder whether that is also a reflection of of the the maybe the maturity or the stage that a lot of the respondents are in. Right, seventy, I think, sorry, fifty percent said they are still experimenting. So, this whole compute scalability might not be top of their mind for them right now. It, it all works, but I think if you would maybe redo this this survey in a year, I would expect that bucket specifically to to widen quite a bit because I think as Gen AI use cases roll out in an organization. The organization will get aware that it's hard and it's more costly to get the right scale or the right compute uh, scale, scalability. And, and I think that one I would expect to go up. The other one on security, I'm also a bit surprised. I would have, I would have thought that maybe security for me also need, means governance. And I would have expected that one to be bigger, especially nowadays after the EU Act came in. Um, you know, that is more on people's mind, right? How, how are they making sure that their data isn't misused, that it isn't just leaving the company uh, by mistake. Um, so again, this one I, I would have expected bigger. But again, maybe it's something that comes as a second step in people's thought, right? But they do the proof of concept, and then only then start they start to think, well, if I move that out now in an industrial state, scale, how does it look with my governance and the overall security? How does it fit into the system or the policies that I already have? Um, even so, I personally think it's too late only doing it now. I think it's really important to do this early on, but um, interested to hear you on that one, specifically this kind of governance angle. No, that is absolutely correct. And outside of the survey, when we think about Cognizant as a global systems integrator, we work with the Global 2000. I would say that in 2024, the amount of programs that we run for data and AI management have almost doubled. Um, so I think for, for us internally, that is an interesting statistics to say that clients are really investing in making sure that the foundational capabilities that are required are worked upon and acted upon. And I also believe that as more and more organizations and clients uh, adopt frameworks like data mesh and data fabric, uh, make some of these organizational changes to ensure that there is somebody responsible uh, for data quality, whether it's from a usage side or whether it's from an onboarding side, um, Hopefully, uh, data quality and usability as an issue area will shrink when we do that uh, in, in the next year or two. Uh, so, so yes, maybe this this is a reflection of the fact that uh, only 20 to 30 percent of the of the clients and organizations have their LLMs in production, and as that number increases, uh, security and compute scalability are, as issue areas will probably rise up. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Should we, I think we basically covered all the key points you wanted to cover so far. Um, I think we talked about that indeed. Uh, maybe just, Sandeep, as a summary from you, you know, when you read the, the report and also now after the discussion, if, if you had to give me a one paragraph summary of your takeaway or you, what do you think are the key points, what, what would they be? I think the, so first of all, the, the survey is extremely well put together and I applaud the the data IQ and the Cognizant teams for the effort in, in, in putting this together. This is a great read. I would encourage everybody in the audience to uh, to get their copies and go through it. Um, as I as I as I spoke about in this in this whole conversation, uh, there's a great 
sense of belief in the transformative potential of generative AI. And we will still see that. That is not fading. The sheen is not off yet. Uh, the number of clients, the number of organizations that will experiment will definitely increase. Uh, and as organizations find successes in their use cases, for example, we were working with a with a large uh, energy utilities company uh, with a focus on renewable energy. And we implemented generative AI, uh, which allowed them to look across thousands of pages of PDF reports to figure out which counties, which states, which zip codes uh, had the propensity where the, the pop general population was favorable uh, for renewable energy. And they used that then to drive uh, their commercialization plans for solar roofs and so on. Right, And that saved them on an average around 20,000 hours of manual effort uh, and around $100,000 uh, in terms of, of capacity, right? So imagine one use case driving that kind of impact. So as clients go ahead and use it and do many of those and realize these benefits, uh, it's going to scale, it's gonna snowball. Uh, yes, the operational challenges are there, they are very real. I also believe they are a little bit of vestigial from the previous issues that have come forward because they were not mitigated. Uh, as I said before, AI is going to shine a light on these issues and uh, people will focus on, on making sure that the foundational issues are taken care of. And AI will also drive the next generation of cloud modernization uh, there. So I think that in a nutshell is, is my uh, summary read from the, the report, uh, but happy to, to sort of see yours as well, you know. So, yeah, when I when I've read it, you know, going back and forth, and I think for me, there were two points that that I think stick out or or not stick out, but if you summarize it, and the one is that obviously, people uh, companies people are experimenting with it, and it's not going to go away. So I think, and it needs to be. I think companies shouldn't make the mistake to try to stitch things together, be it on a two level or processes. I think they need to see this as a significant change. That is going to stay for a while, and as you also say, it's not just for Gen AI. It's it, all of the things that need to be done, most of them at least, are I think work that needs to be done anyway to have an efficient machine learning and AI setup that allows you to quickly test, tie, and test use cases, and then bring them into production, maintain them, and and change them as as required as you know time moves on, and data or this or the environment changes. So. And what that means is I, I think companies need to to start thinking really about simplifying, uh, as I said, I, I'm a believer in this consolidation, simplifying their, their whole setup and, and getting it something into place that helps people work together rather than making it more difficult by having maybe a lot of amazing niche tools that then need to be stitched together to work. So I think that is one. And that applies to the Gen AI field now as, as much as to the generic or the, I hate the word traditional AI, but the, the, the pre-Gen AI uh, field. And I think the other point is, which came up with the, which I mentioned about security and governance. I think for me, that is an aspect again, which you hear more and more about, but I think people are still not taking it seriously enough potentially. And I think that is an area where people need to get on top of really quickly because there is AI governance now in place, so there are regulations in place, at least in the in the European Union, which has knock-on effects far outside of the EU, European Union, of course. And I think companies want to be ahead of that curve. They don't want to, they shouldn't end up later when they have the first use cases in production, realizing, oh, well, maybe there's a regulatory risk here and I'm not fully aware and potentially having to pull that use case or having a lot of free work. So I think the governance aspect is really important and they shouldn't forget that. I mean, there's a lot of great technical things to focus on, but the governance aspect is important and it will get more important in my, in my view. So I think that is uh, another key takeaway. With that, I think we have time for questions. I don't know, I actually haven't seen the chat. Are there are there any key questions or, or themes, Renata, that people asked that are interested in? Yes, yeah, so as a quick reminder, you guys, if you do have any questions, please feel free to submit it. Um, on the right, there is gonna be a question mark, and yeah, that's where you can drop in a few questions. We do have a couple, the first one being from Jeremy Britton. If not IT, where do these responsibilities lie in a business? In traditional businesses, where does this best sit or who is the right structure to have in place to drive these discussions and decide what direction a business goes? 
Is, is this in context of data quality, Renata, or is this uh, overall? Um, I guess overall, Jeremy <laughs> didn't specify, but maybe if you can give us insights on both, Sandeep. Sure. So uh, I think as I as I mentioned in the last three to four years, clients have started on their journey to having a data mesh uh, type of a, an architecture, which is more of an organizational structure. Um, IT's responsibility is making sure that they can get the data available in a usable form. And obviously it has to, to satisfy a set of uh, criteria that the consumers determine, right? But at the end of the day, the what that data product needs to be that you're going to use, whether for your BI use case or a business application or a Gen AI application, the business organizations have to come together and define um, what that data product needs to be, what it needs to contain, what are the criteria that it needs to support, uh, and then create these, uh, uh, these organizational model between data producers and data consumers um, and drive that forward. So that's the, the pervasive or the prevalent uh, trend that we are seeing across as a, as a systems integrator. Um, in terms of, of roles and responsibilities for generative AI, uh, generative AI is one of those unique cases where the business teams, the IT teams, and the security and the legal teams all three teams are out there sitting on the same table and making sure that it is done in a safe, compliant, uh, and correct manner. Uh, so I think for your Gen AI use cases, you have to make sure that, that all of those three constituents are in there. Yeah, and I don't think I have to add much. I think Sandy summarized it really nicely here. And I, it's just this main point, data, data quality, all these responsibilities aren't just in one team. I think that's the main for me. It's across the business. and that mindset that needs to change and i think because then also people can't hide behind the i don't want to say hide but they can't use the excuse oh, i don't trust the data well it's your data if you don't trust your data what have you been doing so i think uh, that, that's one of the absolutely key key takeaways from from that yeah thank you for your answers the second question asks by looking at mad 2024 it's a it's a lot to look at any thoughts on of execution gap or mode of execution for say any common or typical use case for example documentation management and search capability for any enterprise maybe if you if, I, if, you, Sandy, if you don't mind if i jump uh, go ahead so maybe not quite yeah okay so i think let me take a step back. So I think what I take from this, uh, Sandeep also alluded to when, when you looked at the slide, is you can find an amazing tool, and there are a lot of amazing tools out there for each of these niches, right? For every niche in there, in in this on the slide, and there are sub niches which aren't on this slide, even on these slides. And and for certain use cases, that's fine. I mean, sometimes you need to use a very specific tool. But for example, when it comes to this documentation, and especially when you now look at one documentation in the generative AI context. The documentation means transparency, and this is exactly what the, the regulations now request, right? And you, so you need to be able, along the whole development cycle or pipeline, to be able to document basically each step. You want to have all of the documentation easily available and ready. And I think that only happens, you know, having worked in data science teams or engineering teams myself, if it's really, really easy to do. If, if people need to switch tools, or it, then it's an afterthought. So if you are programming and coding one tool, and then you have to you know, start later at some point another tool to put documentation in, you can't get information in automatically, it, it typically doesn't happen, or it's, it's very rudimentary. So I think, for me, the main point here is you need a setup that makes a lot of that as automatic as possible, because you will need to have this kind of stringent documentation now in place when you, if you run a Gen AI, Gen AI use case. And I think for some companies or companies in industries that have always been highly regulated, you know, healthcare or, or financial services, that might not be new and they're used to that. But for companies who are in, in industries that haven't been regulated now, if they do use a Gen AI use case, then now they are regulated, at least in the EU or if, it, if it's applicable. And then they need that. And that I think there's a rethink that companies need to do in order to make sure that all of this happens as easily and efficiently as possible. So I hope I answered that question. I'll probably add two two additional things over here. So the first is the the MAD 
chart is is pretty comprehensive um if you go over and look through i'm sure you will find a tool that you're looking for but at the same time there are new cap there are new categories of tools that are coming in the market right so for example uh when we think about um ai guardrails um how do you stop prompt injections how do you do caching of the results to ensure that uh, your ai finops doesn't go out of whack so there are new and new tools that will continue to come and new categories that will continue to develop as generative ai goes mainstream and it goes towards scaling in terms of the current gaps in capabilities i don't think necessarily there are gaps in capabilities for implementation of a use case you could always go ahead and create a rag based solution uh for anything that you want whether it's for a document summarization uh q and a uh your own knowledge base anything uh the challenge which is there is every capability has got a gen ai component to it so for example you could have an etl tool that has a gen ai capability and you could ask it to write code to create a pipeline you could have a gen ai capability in your bi tool of choice that allows you to effectively interrogate the data you may have a gen ai capability in your data science tool of choice that allows you to write code uh, or, or to sort of accelerate creation of your analytical pipelines or analytical programs but the problem is all of these gen ai agents which are embedded in these tools uh they cannot be daisy chained together they don't talk to each other they are there in their own silos so the gap that we as system integrators and providers see in the market is the need to orchestrate and the need to connect all of these disparate llm based solutions and agents uh, we call that as an agentic framework i think if you go to cognizant and if you search for neuro it a uh, platform you will see that that's our platform to address this gap in the market uh, which is how do we create an orchestration across um, llms across agents and so on so hopefully that that answers the question again it's an evolving field so it could be that there are new classes of tools when we look at the mad report in 2025 i'm sure there will be <laughs> Thank you both for your responses and for attaching examples. That was that was really helpful. Um, moving on to the next question, why can't a big portion of people trust in data? What does a lack of trust in data mean for you? And do you think the historical data can't provide insight about the behavior change and development? Jerno, do you want to do you want to take this first, or uh, it's yeah, very... I'm, I'm, I'm happy to <laughs> I'm happy to jump on it. Uh, so I I don't know. I mean, obviously, I mean, there, I think there's probably a, a multitude of reasons why people come up with this. Uh, we don't trust the data, and I think, as maybe a little bit cynically earlier mentioned, I think sometimes I feel it's been has been used as a bit of a excuse, right? People. As Sandeep mentioned, you know, you you have data was used for especially for BI, especially initially, you know, reporting what's happened, and it's very easy for a business unit if there's a KPI they don't like to say, well, what's behind it, and it's then very hard to pinpoint and and convince everyone that there isn't something, you know, maybe a bit odd, um, which probably hasn't wouldn't change the the actual value of the KPI significant, but and I think that's one of the reasons why people sometimes still cite it as an issue, saying, oh, there's an issue with the data. Uh, so that's one. There is obviously real issues often with data, either because there were system changes and people didn't pay attention to how the how data got transformed, and suddenly things changed, or you know, a des you know, a flow suddenly became an integer, and you have issues, and you've got jumps in your in your curves, and all of these things they happen, they still happen, and that again I think often leads then, especially on the business user side, to this feeling, well, if 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 something can change that quickly, how can I trust the overall trend, and and how do I trust the, the data overall. So I think that's the second one. And then there is the third one, which again is has absolute uh, relevance and is true, is this I think which came up in the question, well, that data is five years old, the market today looks so completely different than five years ago or four years or three years, how can I even use that to predict something going forward or how why should I even look at that? And again, also there are a lot of 
lot of truth is in there. You have to be extremely careful looking at historical data uh, to make a prediction, obviously, like uh, like always. Uh, but again, I think it's often it's often either used as an excuse or potentially because people don't have necessarily the enough understanding how data is then really used in a use case and how it is in terms of the it giving you a probability with uncertainty intervals and all of these things in terms of the outcome and. And I think it's a mixture of all of these things. So there's always a bit of truth in it, but it also is a bit sometimes I feel used as an excuse or because of a lack of understanding how the data is used or will be used in a use case. That, that's my view. I don't know, Sandeep, how, how are you looking at it? Uh, I completely agree. I just have two, two additional points to add. The first is people have their own sources of trusted data in an organization. So in an organization, if there are 10 different sources, um, I may not trust the same data set from a different source, but I would trust that data set coming from a, a different source because historically somehow it has aligned uh, well with me, right? So I think that trusted data is, is a little bit of a misnomer because you are trusting the data. It's just that you're trusting it from a different source, which you are more close to, which is a little bit more in your control and so on. Right? Uh, the second thing over there is, in terms of uh, how much focus have organizations put in things like data quality. Again, going back historically, when it was the era of data warehousing for BI, quality and rules were embedded in your engineering pipelines or they were embedded at the semantic level, semantic layer level, right? But as the data explosion has happened, when your data is across clouds, hybrid, on cloud, on-prem, um, there is no one single standard on how do you drive data quality and how do you measure data quality and implement data quality in there. And clients have just not necessarily made the necessary tooling investments or monetary investments to focus on that. However, I think now we are seeing clients go back and say, okay, we need to uh, take this. I mean, when was the last time somebody said, I'm going to spend a million dollars to clean up all the data um, in my ecosystem? They're probably never. Uh, it's always been done as part of projects and so on. So I think that's one of the reasons why it hasn't been fixed because there was no dedicated focus. But as I said before, AI is shining a light on these issue areas. Uh, so hopefully organizations will uh, uh, do the focus and, and solve for them. Two points. Yep, perfect. So I just want to flag that we are nearing the hour, but I think we do have room for two more questions. Um, another question is by Ernest is, is it possible to think of such a thing as an analytics reference architecture? There is. Uh, without necessarily knowing the, uh, the the details of the analytics reference architecture, I would say that there are reference architectures for generative AI and for driving advanced analytics in terms of what are the core capabilities that are required in a modern data and analytic ecosystem, what the kind of tooling required, uh, how should they connect with each other uh, in the broader scheme of things, right? So an architectural pattern for an analytic reference architecture exists. Look, we'll be more than happy to talk to you after this and and, and walk you through it. Um, so, so yeah, I think from my perspective that, that exists. I think I agree in terms of functionality, what you need, uh, absolutely. I think that is there. I think coming back to the math slide, obviously how you then build this and, and, and implement it, then it gets a bit wild or can become a bit wild. So I don't think on a two level there's any references, but on a functional level, what are the key things, parts, functionality you need? I agree, Sandeep, yes, that one is there and it's, it probably hasn't changed that much. I think there's some new additions now specific to the Gen AI, but otherwise a lot of the old stuff as we talked earlier about is there, it has been there and still is there. Yep, I, I wish the Medellin architecture would sort of die and dissipate. Uh, I think the data redundancy that it creates is is horrible, but that's just a personal opinion. Uh, uh, I, I think that architecture will evolve over a period of time, but uh, it's it's. I think the current architecture is part of a, of a continuum. Yeah. Perfect, which brings us to our last question. 
What can organizations do to have a good assessment of the potential investment of Gen, Gen AI from experimentation to being fully operational? Okay. So look, I think uh, we are probably in the second or the third year of the year of generative AI, right? And the good thing is that a lot of good work has already been done in terms of frameworks uh, and library of use cases. We have a library of use cases. We'd love to talk to you about it after after the, the session. But uh, also, if you look at Gartner, Gartner has come up with, a, with an AI prism uh, and an AI uh, compass navigator uh, that is, is, is pretty sound uh, in terms of letting clients think about where they are in the journey, where do they want to be, and what are the steps that they need to do um, in order to get there. So I think there's there's already great um, information out there in terms of how should uh, organizations be thinking about it. And we'll be happy to talk to them um, as well. I think the one point, maybe just to second that what, what, what Sandeep said, is this idea again, I think you should start from the business side, you start from the business use case. So, you know, this is where you should start. And then you can see what you already have, what is still missing. Otherwise, it's like, well, you're trying to build this ideal setup for something which you don't really know yet. But I think start with, if you start with the business use case, you really go through this process of identifying, prioritizing the key use cases for your organization. And you can obviously get insight for you from the industry, you know, what, 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 what seems to be working in the industry. But once you have that specific to your company, then you can build it up and see, okay, what is really still there or not there and what is missing. I think that would be the, the, my recommendation rather than starting from the other end and saying, well, how does the ideal system look like in order to, to build something? Okay. Well, I guess that about wraps up our webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, massive thank you to you, Sandeep and Journal for sharing very insightful findings from our survey report. I think we can all agree that we definitely learned more than a thing or two from this webinar. Um, again, this recording of the session will be sent to you all via email. And other than that, I guess, have a good day, everybody. Thank you so much again for joining our webinar. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Renaud. Thank you, Renaud.